Hi guys, and welcome to a bonus episode of the Underworld Podcast. I'm Sean Williams in London. Uh, I'm sitting next to a giant jug of water because my throat is screwed. New year, new us, and we're going to be delivering more and more bonuses for those of you decent enough to keep us out the backs of Moldovan gangsters Skodas. Now, first, if you haven't already listened to this week's main show about Sydney's crazy underworld, Comanchero, Hamzies versus Alamadines and Postco gangs, go there give it a go because A, it's wild and B, it's going to tee this one up pretty nicely indeed. And one day not too long from now, we'll drop a huge show about the history of Sydney's mobsters from the early days of it being Australia's quote sin city, including how the bikies got so powerful. But today we're going to take it back only to the late 90s. Spice Girls, New Metal, Noel's House Party, Teddy Sheringham. What a time to be alive. This is when Bassam Hamzi is getting locked up for murder and founding Brothers for Life. It's also post the Royal Police Commission we got into in the main show, when endemic corruption among New South Wales cops was revealed to the extent that some were just straight up dealing drugs, porn and even child sexual abuse imagery right out the backs of stations. Insane stuff. That unspooled the ties between Sydney's underworld and its police, and it led to the rise of the bikies and a spike in violence that's continued today. But it also lit the touch paper on the career and spectacular downfall of one of the country's most fascinating kingpins, one who authorities only released from prison last month. And warning, if you're doing drinking games with this pod for every ridiculous Aussie stereotype we bring up, you're going to be on the floor within 10 minutes, guys. Now, around 20 years ago, Sydney's drug scene wasn't like it is now. There wasn't the influx of synthetic narcotics, fewer addicts, and cops were happy if they picked up the odd few hundred grams or even kilo of cocaine. But in the first few years of the millennium, things change. Cocaine smuggling is getting way more organised and on a far greater scale, and the police are just completely blindsided. So this is just after that commission we spoke about. The cops are no longer working hand in glove with organised gangsters. Things are submerging and the authorities don't really know what's happening. That is until 2004, when a guy calling himself Tom gets in touch with New South Wales cops and offers to blow the lid on Australia's biggest drug syndicate. As proof, Tom hands one officer a photo. In it, he is posing behind a pile of cash around 10.1 million Aussie dollars or around 5 million US. Wearing all black, and hugging a guy in a balaclava. That pal, Tom tells them, is Shane Hatfield. Now, Shane Hatfield is not what you imagine from a massive coke smuggler. He's 37 at the time, slim and tan, with a little beer paunch and flowing tousled locks. Friends call him Curly. In typically Aussie style, Hatfield was an international surf champion, but in recent years he's been out of work, or so his details suggest. In fact, Hatfield lives in a swanky apartment overlooking Sydney's world-famous Bondi Beach. It's not the kind of shag pad you'd expect from a down-on-his-luck surfer dude. As Tom tells it, in fact, Hatfield is Australia's biggest drug importer and the head of a growing empire. Cops understandably wonder whether Tom is telling some tall tales, but over time, they get to trust him. Turns out, Tom has been in the field, doing hand-to-hands, securing packages and keeping contacts sweet, putting his ass on the line, basically, while his pal and boss Hatfield stays at home, paranoid and bullying everyone around him. He's a micromanager, overbearing. Tony Robbins would hate him. Soon enough, Tom crosses over from gangster to supergrass, and he's the key cog in an operation called Mocker, like the drink. And the information he gives Sydney's cops, it's unreal. Wearing a wire to just about every meeting imaginable, cops get audio and video of high-level deals with street dealers. And at one point, Tom even hands officers a map with an X marked right on the spot where he and Hatfield have buried several kilos of cocaine worth over a million bucks. By the start of 2005, New South Wales police have a solid case against Curley and they catch Sydney's real-life Bodie from Point Break doing six-figure handovers with known crooks all over town. 
If you type Shane Hatfield, that's Shane with a Y, unfortunately. Sorry, Australia, but that's a crime, as is Sean with an SH. You'll see a bunch of amazing undercover videos, all done by Tom and his handlers. It's pretty nuts footage. Anyway, amid this gold mine, police give Tom the go-ahead to sell seven kilos of coke directly into the Sydney community. That is a lot of Class A's, and it'll get the state in a touch of bother further down the line. And all the while, Hatfield just comes across as this grungy, kind of braised and Ellis character, lolloping about in flip-flops, sorry, again, Aussies, thongs, and moaning about his life. At one point, he and Tom meet at what looks like the bleachers of a high school playing field. Hatfield tells his old pal he's, quote, bored shitless. On everything that I've got, he continues, I'll have 12 million in five years' time. Ah, oh, how boring. Hatfield, though, gets paranoid. He buries cash in his relative's back garden and has nightmares that insects and grubs are going to eat it all, which I imagine is the same dream pretty much every Australian has most nights. So he hands the cash over to Tom, who of course hands it straight over to the cops. In total, Tom gets a hold of 1.9 million bucks of Hatfield's money and his boss and friend doesn't suspect a thing. In fact, Hatfield even tells Tom he wants them both to retire on their ill-gotten gains and buy adjoining villas by the beach. This is a proper underworld bromance. But for that to come off, Hatfield plans his biggest scam yet. He pulls together two of Sydney's biggest criminal names. One is Les Mara, a former rugby league star, and the other is Michael Hurley, a career crook insiders know as the, quote, Prince of Thieves. Together with Tom... The syndicate plans to import 200 kilos of South American cocaine worth around 34 million Australian dollars into Sydney via mules, their suitcases getting by airport customs with the help of a fleet of bought-off baggage handlers. It's Hatfield's contacts making it happen, and the other two guys can get the stuff out of the airport and onto the streets. So, to recap, in case you've forgotten how Australian this all is, we've got a surf champion and his old mate, a rugby player and a prince of thieves, planes to ship coke, all while the lead man is bored out of his mind. Oh, and none of them are ever out of t-shirts and shorts. I mean, Australia truly is the Florida panhandle of the Southern Hemisphere. Tom is ratting the guys out non-stop, and eventually Mara and Hurley get wind he's the mole they've suspected all along. They tell Hatfield, who meets Tom one afternoon and tells them they're going on a quote, surprise drive. Now, Tom is understandably shitting his pants, but he doesn't actually go so far as to physically saw his cargo shorts outright, which is useful because, in fact, Curly has driven them to one of Sydney's swimming pools and wants them to go for a dip. Tom's relief is only fleeting, however, as he realises Hatfield doesn't necessarily want to critique his backstroke, but rather to get him into speedos so he can check if he's wearing a wire. And, of course, he is. While Hatfield purchases the pair two pairs of skimpies, Tom whips out the wire and puts it in his pocket, incredibly keeping it running the whole time. Hatfield apologises to his mate, tells him he, quote, had to do it, and that his mind's at rest. Donnie Brasco, eat your heart out. The swimming pool episode is too much heat for the police to allow Tom to take, though, so they decide to swoop. It's May 2005, and New South Wales police go on a raiding spree. They arrest 12 drug smugglers across Sydney, Mara and Hurley, the rugby star and the Prince of Thieves, they empty their apartments and they skip town. But they too will be nabbed within months. Then cops go for the big kahuna, Curly. He leaves them a handwritten note. Dear sir, it reads, please don't break the door down. Please knock it. If someone is here, they will open it. Thank you. He hyperventilates when officers cuff him and reels with a gosh while they take him downtown. Months later, a court sentences him to 24 years behind bars. Tom, meanwhile, has been living in witness protection ever since. Cops then come under a ton of fire for allowing Tom to sell over 7 kilos of coke on Sydney's streets. Kind of makes a mockery of drug prohibition if the police will allow such a huge amount to flood the market, right? Anyway, here is New South Wales Drug Squad Chief Nick Bingham talking to the Daily Telegraph about the whole thing. Quote, this was the first time New South Wales and Australia really saw such an organised method of importation and on such a large scale. They certainly knew what they were doing. In those days, if we got a few kilos, we were excited. 
So 200 kilograms was a major deal. Now it's commonplace with tons being imported. So not, not the best news after that. Hatfield serves 17 of his 24 years. He's since been diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. And given he walked free on December 20 last year, you'd hope he's been getting some pretty good mental health care behind bars. But yeah, that is the tale of Sydney's surfing coke king and Operation Mocker. Just made for a crappy director's TV film, if you ask me. Directors, once again, that email, theunderworldpodcast at gmail.com. We can do your screenplays. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry to all filmies, but I don't like Point Break. Point Break.